The Blue Castle, a novel by L. M. Lucy Maud, Montgomery. Chapter 13 Uncle Benjamin found he had reckoned without his host when he promised so airily to take Valency to a doctor. Valency would not go. Valency laughed in his face. Why on earth should I go to doctor? Marsh? There's nothing the matter with my mind. Though you all think I've suddenly gone crazy. Well, I haven't. I've simply grown tired of living to please other people and have decided to please myself. It will give you something to talk about besides my stealing the raspberry jam. So that's that. Doss, said Uncle Benjamin, solemnly and helplessly. You are not like yourself. Who am I like, then? asked Valency. Uncle Benjamin was rather posed. Your grandfather wants Barra, he answered desperately. Thanks. Valency looked pleased. That's a real compliment. I remember Grandfather Juan's Barra. He was one of the few human beings I have known, almost the only one. Now it is of no use to scold or entreat or command, Uncle Benjamin, or exchange anguished glances with Mother and Cousin Stickles. I am not going to any doctor. And if you bring any doctor here I won't see him. So what are you going to do about it? What indeed? It was not seemly, or even possible to hail Valency Dr. Wards by physical force. And in no other way could it be done, seemingly. Her mother's tears and imploring entreaties availed not. Don't worry, mother, said Valency, lightly but quite respectfully. It isn't likely I'll do anything very terrible. But I mean to have a little fun. Fun! Mrs. Frederick uttered the word as if Valency had said she was going to have a little tuberculosis. Olive, sent by her mother to see if she had any influence over Valency, came away with flushed cheeks and angry eyes. She told her mother that nothing could be done with Valency. After she, Olive, had talked to her just like a sister, tenderly and wisely, all Valency had said, narrowing her funny eyes to mere slips, was, I don't show my gums when I laugh more as if she were talking to herself than to me. Indeed, mother, all the time I was talking to her she gave me the impression of not really listening. And that wasn't all. When I finally decided that what I was saying had no influence over her I begged her, when Cecil came next week, not to say anything queer before him, at least. Mother, what do you think she said? I'm sure I can't imagine, groaned Aunt Wellington, prepared for anything. She said I'd rather like to shock Cecil. His mouth is too red for a man's. Mother, I can never feel the same to Valency again. Her mind is affected, Olive, said Aunt Wellington solemnly. You must not hold her responsible for what she says. When Aunt Wellington told Mrs. Frederick what Valency had said to Olive, Mrs. Frederick wanted Valency to apologize. You made me apologize to Olive fifteen years ago for something I didn't do, said Valency. That old apology will do for now. Another solemn family conclave was held. They were all there except Cousin Gladys, who had been suffering such tortures of neuritis in her head, ever since poor Doss went queer, that she couldn't undertake any responsibility. They decided, that is, they accepted a fact that was thrust in their faces that the wisest thing was to leave Valency alone for a while. Give her her head, as Uncle Benjamin expressed it. Keep a careful eye on her but let her pretty much alone. The term of watchful waiting had not been invented then, but that was practically the policy Valency's distracted relatives decided to follow. We must be guided by developments, said Uncle Benjamin. It is, solemnly, easier to scramble eggs than unscramble them. Of course, if she becomes violent. Uncle James consulted Dr. Ambrose Marsh. Dr. Ambrose Marsh approved their decision. He pointed out to irate Uncle James, who would have liked to lock Valency up somewhere, out of hand, that Valency had not, as yet, really done or said anything that could be construed as proof of lunacy, and without proof you cannot lock people up in this degenerate age. 
nothing that Uncle James had reported seemed very alarming to Dr. Marsh, who put up his hand to conceal a smile several times. But then he himself was not a sterling, and he knew very little about the old valency. Uncle James stalked out and drove back to Deerwood, thinking that Ambrose Marsh wasn't much of a doctor, after all, and that Adelaide Sterling might have done better for herself.